the China Insight. We're delighted to resume the China Insight series here at the Center for Emerging Markets at Northeastern. Uh, in the last uh, a few sessions you've heard from professors Michael Enright and Dave Sherman. Uh, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce George Yip, who is a distinguished uh, visiting professor at, of international business and strategy at the Damore McKim School of Business and also a distinguished fellow of the Center for Emerging Markets. George is a uh, very well-known name in the fields of strategy and international business. He uh, has taught at several of the world's top business schools, including HBS, uh, UCLA, Imperial College, London Business School, um, China Europe International Business School, and was Dean of the Rotterdam School of Management at uh, Erasmus University. And we are absolutely thrilled to have George join the Damore McKim family and to be part of the Center for Emerging Markets. Today, he's going to talk about uh, research he just published in the Harvard Business Review in the September-October issue of this year. So it's really hot off the press. The topic, as you know, is how Chinese retailers are reinventing the customer journey. And George will also be presenting again on December the 1st uh, on innovation strategies for foreign companies in China. And in November, just to get so you can get it on your calendars, Michael Enright will be back to talk about the impact of foreign firms on China's economy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to George. George. Okay, thank you very much, Ravi, for the introduction. And thank you, all of you, for joining this talk this evening, US time. I know some of you are joining from China and elsewhere. So, in fact, The Economist magazine opened this year, the first cover story of this year, said why retailers everywhere should look to China. But in fact, we had already been working on this study for a whole year before The Economist article came out. So we were very glad to see The Economist, <clears throat> this eminent British uh, news magazine, was endorsing what we were doing. And as Ravi mentioned, we've just published this article, Hot Off the Press. <clears throat> this is the first page of the article and Harvard Business Review put in some very nice photographs as well, uh, showing uh, different people and everything they had bought on the internet. In fact, on this picture, this guy has bought an aerial drone is one of the things that you can, uh, that you can see there. And here are my two co-authors, Mark Grieven, who's a Dutch, I worked with him at Rotterdam School of Management, then he went to Zhejiang University in China. Now he's at IMD Business School in Switzerland and Catherine Sien, a, a senior professor at China Europe International Business School, where I spent five years as the co-director of the Center on China Innovation. That's how I got seriously into China research. I mean, I've been researching about China for 20 years, but seriously for the last 10 years since I took up a faculty position at CIBS in Shanghai. So China has a huge online market. First of all, if we just look at the retail market as a whole, $5 trillion in 2020, similar in size uh, to the US market, and it's highly dig digitized. So online sales growing about 25% every year for the last seven years. And online is a bigger, much bigger share in China than in the US, 25% of total retail versus 12% in the US. And even more interesting, 90% of online sales in China are, are on mobile devices versus 50% in the US. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why Chinese mobile phones are so big, because our Chinese consumers spend so much time on them, in addition to the need to accommodate the very difficult Chinese characters. That's why it was very um, large phones. So it's no surprise then that China is leading the way in developing video retail, social commerce, community retail, retail as a service, and many other new digital channels, and especially the super app. Uh, and I'll talk more about that, you know, apps that combine everything. So who are some of these leaders? Uh, Dao Yin, known in the West as TikTok, and you know, the logo on the right, which started as an entertainment app for sharing short videos, mostly by teenagers. And they soon discovered that many users were commenting on the popular videos by creating uh, their own versions. So now uh, many people are uploading their own videos, uh, of course. 
such that now it is an important platform. And Douyin encouraged participation by enabling content creators who often featured their favorite products and clothing styles, making the app a marketing tool as well. Then uh, Pin Door, uh, the logo on the bottom right, is the largest agriculture focused platform in China and was founded in 2015 and is currently worth $175 billion and sometimes described as Groupon on steroids. It has gamified the shopping process, enabling groups to haggle with merchants, often via WeChat. And then there's this young man there with a the lipstick, Li Jiaqi. He's known as the Lipstick King. He's a 28 year old influencer who's pioneered digital cosmetics retailing. He boasts more than 7 million followers on Weibo, which is the Chinese uh, Twitter, and close to 40 million on Douyin. He once sold 15,000 lipsticks in just five minutes and tried on 380 lipsticks in a seven hour live streaming show. And he's the only male key opinion leader for cosmetics and the best salesperson for beauty. Now, these innovators owe much of their success to the massive ecosystems of, and you've heard of them all, Alibaba, JD.com, and Tencent, and increasingly these smaller ones, which I've started to mention, Pinduoduo, uh, ByteDance, which owns TikTok amongst its uh, various products, and Meituan, which also has key touch points for consumers. And they attract Chinese retailers and international brands by leveraging ever more data with innovations such as Alibaba's uh, Tmall Smart Selection, which is a product recommendation algorithm, and Meituan's highly sophisticated logistics routing algorithm. And retailers in Europe and the US don't have access to such integrated ecosystems but they could usefully borrow from China's uh, innovators. Now, to identify what Western companies should do, this is the research that we conducted. We looked at 25 Chinese digital retail companies, including the giants, Alibaba, JD.com, and Meituan, and Tencent, and emerging platforms, ByteDance, Pinduoduo, LME, and successful brands like Peacebird, Forest Cabin, et cetera, and discussions with dozens of executives from Western companies. And we drew five lessons from the Chinese experience. I won't read through these now because I'm going to go through each one of them in depth. So the first one is to create single entry points. So a single point online where customers can access all their potential purchases is really the holy grail for retailers. And China's digital giants have come close to achieving it with a combination of ecosystem access points, general platforms offering portals for independent brands and proactive automated product recommendations. So for most digital retail consumers in China, the first port of call is uh, Taobao, Alibaba's mobile C2C portal. So you can see that on the uh, top left, 10 o'clock of the circle. Uh, or Alipay, uh, which is on the, the bottom at six o'clock, uh, six o'clock, both of which give access to Alibaba's full ecosystem. And Alipay, which is on almost every smartphone in China, integrates the platforms and service offerings of companies in Alibaba's huge retail network, enabling consumers to pay for any product or service they may be looking for, from Nike shoes to wealth management. Or Tencent's ecosystem, their WeChat Pay provides similar benefits and although users may not start out with an intention to transact, WeChat pays deep integration with external platforms and specific brands means that they often end up doing just that, buying something. And WeChat has pioneered a concept that allows any brand to develop dedicated but light sub applications within the WeChat ecosystem and not a fully developed independent application. So really making it easy for people to add on to the Tencent ecosystem. So one of the interesting things is that, do you remember historically that uh, retailers used to be king, they had push power, and then consumer marketers like Procter & Gamble came along and developed what we, the marketing profession called pull power. Well, digital has now gone back from pull power to push power, and digital has shifted the power relationships back to retail through recommendation algorithms live streaming by KOLs, key opinion leaders, and native or embedded online e-commerce stores 
in TikTok. All these have changed the traditional dynamic whereby a purchase begins with a customer's search for a product. So instead, for instance, Tmall Smart Selection uses an AI-powered algorithm backed by deep learning and natural language processing to recommend products for shoppers. It then communicates consumer interest to retailers so that they can increase inventory to keep up with demand. And then this kind of functionality reflects the growing power of retailers relative to manufacturers. So push power rather than pull power by manufacturers. And Chinese retailers go further than Amazon does in aggressively leveraging their partners and third party providers. And so it means that Chinese retailers are already profitably offering at scale most of Amazon's newer and not yet scaled offerings, such as healthcare, insurance, online groceries, smart home, and fashion. Now, for each of these five um, Chinese developments and journeys, we looked at the options for the West and what Western companies could do. So, you know, the challenge for Western retailers is to get closer to where the consumer is online. So remember, the story I'm telling you is that in, instead of selling to a consumer when they're actually at the retail website, go and find the consumer where, wherever they are, watching entertainment, chatting to their friends, and hijack them to the retail website. Yes, Western retailers do this, but Chinese companies do it much more so. Actually, at least in Europe, the uh, data protection GDPR experience helps because they've, they, they've now learned more and more how to control the right kinds of information flows. But beyond privacy issues, there are a few barriers to one-stop solutions because it's low cost to establish comprehensive platforms and new entrants can seize this opportunity. So a couple of examples in the West, the Otto Group, uh, that red logo in Germany is a case in point. It's been a catalog retailer for decades and it, it initially struggled with the arrival of Amazon and Zalando, a German online shoe and fashion company, but also made early moves into retail solutions, in particular leveraging ventures such as Risk Ident, which is fraud prevention, and Pickalike, which is a visual search, to get closer to regular customer touch points and build a platform with thousands of partners. Another example uh, is Lydia, an emerging financial services super app from France, which offers peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer payment, flexible sub-accounts, virtual cards for um, Apple Pay and Google Pay, and many other functions typically associated with Chinese super apps. The real potential of uh, super apps is not that they can replace credit cards or cash, is that they provide a single entry point for consumers incorporating financial services and everything else that the uh, consumer might want, um, including lending, investment and insurance on the financial side, e-commerce, goods delivery and tracking, ticketing for movies, live shows, airplanes, trains, healthcare services, including hospital reservations, medical consultations, pharmacies, taxi hailing. So you don't have to go to a separate app for the taxi hailing. Bike sharing and a wide range of government functions, including taxation, paying your taxes that way. The second lesson is to that we can learn from China is to embed digital evaluation in the customer journey because we're constantly asking retailers are constantly asking customers to evaluate, and you know we all hate that actually. But a key challenge is to ensure that consumers can efficiently and effectively evaluate their products in a transparent and unbiased way. So simple scoring or comments on TripAdvisor and Amazon are no longer the standard for Chinese consumers. Chinese consumers provide thousands of clearly categorized and detailed comments about products, brands, and shops on JD.com, Tmall, and Taobao, often with photos or videos attached. Um, they have independent platforms in reaching a purchase decision. Chinese consumers rely on independent, pla independent platforms such as Jihu and uh, Jishi Xingqiu. And they rely a lot on influencers. In the US, people follow key influencers such as uh, Taylor Swift and Je Kylie Jenner, primarily on Instagram whereas China's opinion leaders have a presence on Weibo, WeChat, TikTok, and many other platforms. Then there's a video live streaming, uh, 
by the, including by the influencers, Chinese consumers also frequently consult live streamers who consist of three main types, CEOs, movie actors, and musical artists, and professional sellers. So here's a CEO, um, the CEO of Gree Electric Appliances. She sold $44 million in three hours on one occasion. She looks like a charming woman. In fact, she is known as the toughest woman in China. Her name is Dong Mingzhu, and the aphorism about her is that where Sister Dong walks, no grass grows. She is really, really tough. Then there's a uh, Vaya, who is China's Kim Kardashian. And she is known as the number one sister of Taobao life, a huge uh, influencer. What are some options for the West? Again, establish presence on all the channels where consumers evaluate products, particularly video-based social media channels, and overcome their mistrust of promotional messaging and positive reviews on company websites. So some, some examples. Currently, the most popular live streaming uh, in, in the West runs on gaming platforms such as Twitch. They have a tie in with Amazon, which makes it a platform for influencer sales. Meanwhile, uh, the, the next logo over, NTWRK Network, a mobile first video shopping platform that blends entertainment and commerce and other new platforms are gaining traction. So, you know, on, on the right hand side, it's selling some shoes to the user. The, the third lesson is don't think of sales as isolated events. Offer as much of a seamless experience as possible. So deeply integrated. Seamless experience when and where the consumer chooses can to be radically increases the chances of a purchase. In the digital realm, China's achieved this in three ways. Deeply integrated online and offline sales. So at Alibaba's Hema Fresh, that's that first um, photo, Hema Fresh supermarket, consumers decide how to buy while sitting at home or on the way to the market or even in the store. They might want fresh food delivered or they can pick it up while shopping for other products. The next one down, JD.com, after they invested in the Yonghui supermarket uh, chain, Superstores, in 2015, it connected that company's online supermarkets to the JD to Home application, which was launched that year in collaboration with Dada, a local online delivery company. And then the two merged the following year. And then this level in, of integration brings really big uh, advantages. Secondly, continuous purchasing opportunities. So in China, a purchase can be made at almost any point in an individual's entire online experience. A consumer might buy directly from an official WeChat account while chatting with friends or in one of WeChat's mini program roles, or Alipay's mini program for a brand that has advertised in a friend circle or been recommended in an alumni group. Entertainment and shopping are fully integrated as well. A Chinese consumer watching a TikTok video can click on clothes she likes and end up in a, a embedded store, what they call a native store. Or she might follow a friend's recommendation on WeChat to buy a product at a discount via Pinduoduo. And thirdly, AI, artificial intelligence enabled interfaces, AI powered chatbots such as Dian Xiaomi, which can understand more than 90% of customers Queries are widely used in China. They did most of the talking during Xiaomi's uh, singles day on November 11, 2020, when uh, Alibaba's online transactions exceeded $74 billion. So, sorry, so not just Xiaomi, but China's singles day. And then this after sales service in terms of delivery, return, and warranty conducted primarily online. 94% of online service at Alibaba is AI enabled and earns customer satisfaction. 3% higher than service delivered by staffers. People prefer artificial intelligence to real people. Options for the West. Um, cut across the silos of online. General Motors does that. The granddaddy of offline manufacturing now has more than 100 social uh, media channels. Walmart, the archetypal bricks and mortar retailer, announced in February 2020 
that would combine its store and online buying teams in one omni-channel merchandising group. In the Netherlands, uh, one of the largest European e-commerce markets, Schmidt Zavis, is uh, in the second row, seafood retailer, is taking advantage of the online supermarket picnic and they work together. Consumers can now decide where to buy their products and when with smooth home delivery or in-store pickup options. Right. So many ways in which uh, Western companies can start to rethink this aspect of the Chinese journey. The fourth new part of the journey is to rethink the logistical fundamentals. So China recombines old fashioned delivery methods, gig workers on a bicycle and high tech software to deliver faster. So the gig workers may be riding bikes, but they're guided by routing software that speedily provides a large quantity of information. Once an order is placed, a middleware system subtracts it from the inventory, puts the information into the company's CRM system, chooses the nearest outlet for fast delivery and alerts the nearest delivery worker. The delivery workers app will even tell him or her which stairs to take inside a building to get to the right floor as instructions are passed on by the customer. So as a result, delivery in China is extremely fast and such efficiency enables workers to earn a good living while employers can track each employee's contribution. And often that means that delivery is totally free to the customer. So I was very upset I had to pay $12 to get a shirt delivered from JC Penny, And it's gonna take them two days in any case. So delivery costs are so low that most merchants can afford to cover them completely. Again, what are the options for the West? Well, you know, it's much more difficult in the West. Can you imagine bicycle delivery in Los Angeles and the, look at that uh, freeway spaghetti? Um, nor is there an equivalent workforce. You've all heard of the migrant workers in China. Um, and these are the ones who are primarily doing the delivery services. They're navigating the urban layouts and stricter labor regulation of course, and uh, ongoing fights in different states as to how gig workers can be uh, regulated. But, you know, Western companies are working on it. Um, you can see that Amazon is working on a prime delivery robot, a delivery bot. And another example, the, Swiss, uh, the Swedish company Ericsson, along with Enride, Einride, German company and Tilia have partnered to launch a 5G powered, powered driverless and environmentally friendly trucks. And Neuro, a self-driving delivery startup is teaming up with Domino's, Walmart and CVS in the US. And fifthly, always stay close to the customer. Now, we all think we stay close to the customer, but it's really, really true in China. In China, the customer is treated like royalty. Um, you, people, they don't actually dress up like to go to stores. Um, this, this may be for a wedding or something like that, but Chinese do like to dress up as royalty sometimes. So there's extraordinarily high levels of after sales engagement by companies. You know, really radical engagement. Most online shops offer free returns with no explanation within seven days of a purchase, except for fresh produce, of course. Uh, customers can choose a convenient pickup time for their return products, and retailers offer instantaneous personal assistance via chat box. I still find it difficult to return used printer cartridges. You know, how easily do you find returning used printer cartridges in the, in the USA or in Europe? Uh, integration across entry points, Coup uh, use things like coupons and digital red envelopes, you know, the gift, gift envelopes, which are traditionally exchanged by relatives and friends during celebrations. These are daily offerings on large platforms such as Taobao, Tmall, JD.com, and Meituan, which is for restaurant food order and delivery. And online shops offer deep discounts every day during certain hours. And then influencer relationships, in many cases, uh, key opinion leaders, KOLs, command more loyalty than the brands that they recommend. 
Chinese retailers piggyback on that relationship by cooperating with these KOLs to often become associated with a particular brand. And lastly, fan marketing. So for example, the home electronics company Xiaomi, most initially mobile phones, has created a huge crowd of loyal users who helped promote the brand. Its fans will buy anything Xiaomi sells and they also help it to design the product and come up with regular innovation suggestions every day. Now the company has its own online ecosystem, having partnered with more than 300 producers to sell their products to its fans under the Xiaomi brand. Options for the West, leverage digital platforms to reward loyalty rewards. Uh, more often, more explicitly in more places, have continuous tech-enabled tracking of service delivery processes, really motivate the sales agents and other employees to attend to the customer needs and create an online community of users. You know, some Western companies are doing this, and I think Peloton is the prime example of that, has, you know, a huge part of their appeal is their creation of an online community of users, which has been a major driver of their success and a source of innovation ideas. And they're so lucky they launched a, you know, just before COVID. Another one, uh, US-based company, although originally started in China, is not Shine, but pronounced Shein because it's clothing for for, for females and at least one fast fashion retailer founded in China in 2008, based in the US, uses influencers as its main channel to customers. It's hugely successful uh, to, in this approach and the 7,000 employees themselves also have to act as influencers. They bring 6,000 new products are added daily, 600,000 products available across the site at all times, 100 items used per style and 10 billion sales last year, 32 million active daily users. So it is possible to um, create this kind of connection with fans and users in a very symbiotic way. And so Chi In is now challenging Zara, the longtime leader in fast fashion. In summary, Western retailers lag their Chinese counterparts in leveraging customer data to make better business decisions, to increase operational efficiency and reduce costs. They need to integrate this data with offline businesses so that customers are visible, identifiable and traceable both online and offline. And then through multiple uh, touch points, including social media ecosystems, smart retailers need to establish contact with customers online to increase their stickiness, loyalty, and activity. Digital retailing is an organizational transformation in the making. And I'll finish up with, of course, a Chinese fortune cookie type saying. The Chinese saying is that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Well, the new customer journey begins with many steps. Thank you very much. And we can take uh, questions. Stop the sharing. I'll take a little chat. George, do you see? Uh, yes, I, 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 I've, I've got some uh, yeah. uh, questions. I mean, customer satisfaction is measured um, in similar ways. It's just that they get more, I think they get more information. I mean, in the West, we're also reluctant to respond to these customer service, right? You, as, soon as, you've, as soon as you've ordered it, they ask you to report on that experience. But in China, because of the deep integration with the customer journey, they're able to get the customers to respond and in detail. Then Lai Ming Wei asked an interesting question, how can the logistics system in China keep maintaining high efficiency in the future? 10 to 20 years with huge aging population and declining number of newborns. Artificial intelligence and robots. China is moving very fast to replace the aging workforce with an, 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 the aging workforce and the small numbers entering the workforce with artificial intelligence and 
robots. That said, the small number, the, the small number of young people are still finding hard to get rewarding jobs. So there aren't, there isn't an excess of jobs relative to the number of people. Now, of course, the government uh, is you know, trying to reverse the one child policy, suggesting three children, discouraging abortions now. Yeah. Other questions? George, can I can can I jump in and ask? Uh, Please, yes. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Um, in the when you say options for the West, are are those ideas that you are already finding some Western companies are using an element of what you observed in China, or is that? Uh, uh, and also, do you have any examples of foreign companies in China and I'm playing in? Yeah, are playing in that environment. So take a. Uh, you know, Western retailers that are still in, in China. How do you see them adopting some of the same practices given that they operate in that kind of competitive uh, environment? Yeah. Well, first of all, in every section in the article, options on the West, and what I talked about just now, we look for examples of Western companies that are at the leading edge of doing this. So I, I just thought, you know, like I talked about Peloton as an example of a Western company that is really using the fan base right? and similarly um, Xi'in which is a high hybrid company so our message is we've tried to show how some western companies are doing it but not as much as the Chinese companies are doing it now that links to uh C. Gopinath's question which has just popped up is the western consumer behavior comparable to the Chinese is that a key assumption before we draw lessons for the west uh, it's, that's, uh, of course they're different but um you, you can still draw lessons. You know, if you say you can't draw lessons from any other country where the consumer is different, then we might as well stop teaching international business. What we teach, of course, is that you have to understand what the differences are and therefore how you adapt it. An obvious one, for example, is uh, privacy of data. Uh, in the West, we cannot go as far with data as they do in China because China has much less, uh, has, uh, much less privacy. Um, well, the, the top three, I think the interesting thing in China now is that the top three retailers are the online companies like uh, Alibaba. Yeah. Alibaba in particular is the, is the huge one. Uh, David Nardone um, has a question about China's increasing restrictions on this financial access. I think it's a different kind of issue. This is more of a corporate governance politics play, because clearly it's no coincidence that as soon as Jack Ma started to criticize government regulation, the Chinese government response is, hey, we're gonna regulate you even more and we're gonna stop the uh, public offering of um, Alipay. I mean, the government is perhaps looking at breaking up Alibaba because it's worried about uh, antitrust issues, but China, uh, Unlike, I think, some Western governments, the Chinese government since 1979, 78, 79, has not really had a record of shooting itself in the foot when it comes to business. So it's been pretty good at protecting and nurturing the comp competitive advantages of Chinese companies. So while it may be regulating them a bit more, uh, one of the things you have to remember is that because of the system of the Communist Party, having a chapter in every company above a certain size, communications between the companies and the, com and the government are extremely good. Of course, in the West, uh, there's criticism that the connections are too strong. I actually personally interviewed the VP of strategy at Alibaba, and he said, you know, I spend a big percentage of my time just dealing with the government. Uh, I'm just going down these questions one by one. So Klaus Ma, what are the implications for competition policy? You see a lot of market power of some key plays. Yeah. Well, as we said, the Chinese government is just waking up within the last year to uh, antitrust issues and reducing the power 
of these companies. But in general, China worries much less about uh, antitrust issues. Because remember, the power of the Chinese government to intervene means that they can actually stop, they can stop any company doing anything at any time. So they don't necessarily have to worry about letting a company get too big and then have difficulty pulling them back. So I, I think that's, that's the issue. I mean, China is developing its competition policy now. So we really seem to see what happens there. The next question, Kersal Kao. I sense some key factors leading to the success of digital retailing in China, such as low logistics costs and ample supplies of all types of goods. Difficult to be transferred anytime soon. Um, well, the low logistics cost, yeah. But again, you know, we've tried to abstract some of the lessons. And then the, his supplemental is, I wonder if it is more, more easily rep, to be repeated in some Asian markets, such as India and Indonesia. Absolutely. So um, the uh, gig, gig workers, you know, India, and there's even a Harvard case, uh, business school case study about the uh, Tiffin Wallers in India who are, you know, the original delivery gig, they're the original delivery workers, except they weren't gig workers because I think they were full time. For those who don't know what the Tiffin Wallers are, in India, it is the tradition that uh, and it's men, I have to say, that when they go to work, their wives will cook them a hot lunch, put it into a metal container, and the Tiffin Wallers will pick it up from the man's house and deliver it, even if it is an hour away. And they'll be picking up, you know, several dozen of these, each, uh, each delivery person, and deliver it without failure. In fact, there's even a movie, uh, a quasi love story, uh, about this, um, the, the lunchbox is delivered to the wrong man and the man starts communicating with somebody else's wife about that. So certainly, and same issue for Indonesia, which is lots of low cost people. Um, India and Indonesia have lots of bicycles. Uh, definitely a good, good question. Uh, Hasmuk Shah, can you compare trust between consumers and companies in China versus Western countries and why? I, interestingly, of course, China is a low trust society um, and with low trust goes low honesty as well. But ironically, Chinese consumers don't worry so much about, say, influencers who are being paid by companies. You know, in the West, we worry about the independence of influencers and people endorse products. Um, but in China, they accept this. I think because of the relationship culture and Guangxi, Nobody is independent in China, so everybody is, is in a relationship. So in the West, we have this ideal that people should give independent opinions, even though, of course, they don't really. You know, if you've been watching tennis recently, don't you love the fact that um, after someone wins the US Open, the next thing they do, they pull out some watch by Rolex and, and put it on. That's the only time they're wearing that watch, not during the match, not the rest of their lives, but immediately after they they, they won the match. And um, so here I am, I'm, I'm gonna endorse uh, my watch, Barman Mercier, but I haven't received any money for this, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so actually there's lots of bias in the West anywhere. Uh, I mean, lack of independence. How does the Chinese government view the large side of luxury brands with Chinese consumers? Hasn't been a problem so far because remember Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is glorious. They wanted to encourage people to want luxury brands. By the way, there's a wonderful um, uh, comment about the Chinese view of luxury brands. Perhaps the, so when I was there in China about eight years ago, nine years ago, there was a TV dating program and the usual kind of dating program. And one young Chinese man said to one young Chinese woman on, on the program, said, well, you know, I, I, I'm not a rich man. So would you go, on a date with me on a bicycle? And she replied, no, I would rather cry in the back of a BMW than smile on the back of a bicycle. That is the Chinese relationship to luxury brands. By the way, fantastic publicity for BMW. You can't better than that. And by the way, a, a 
BMW's transliteration of its brand in China, Baoma means precious horse, brilliant, brilliant translation. Chen Long Chen, could you please make comments on the different attitudes to, of Chinese and Western companies towards private issues? Seems like Chinese consumers care less about the privacy in their search history, posting experience are easy to record. Well, my, my wife is um, English actually, and when we when I took her back to Hong Kong for the first time after we got married, uh, we had a problem that our relatives wouldn't give us privacy. And in fact, there is no easy word in China, in Chinese for privacy. In, in, in the West, in English, privacy has a positive connotation. In Chinese, the equivalent word takes a number of words to say it. In Cantonese, which is the language I know, si sai sangwu, means something slightly shady that you want to keep secret. That's why Chinese culture doesn't have the same attitude toward privacy. And remember, Chinese have grown up in extended families, in crowded homes. They don't have privacy. And this, by the way, is another reason why mobile phones became so popular. To have privacy, you go out into the street to call your friends because you may often not have your own, well, it, um, uh, you're in a very crowded apartment, your parents can hear what you're saying, or you may, in the old days, you were sharing a bedroom with your parents until recently. Klaus Meyer again, China's actually stronger in implementing competition policy with digital majors, because they don't have to deal with challenges in the courts as the EU has to. There's very interesting, uh, picks up a very interesting, I've been listening to two books by Francis Fukuyama, who became famous for the end of history, but two recent books in which he says, uh, you need three things to have a successful country, democracy, a strong bureaucracy, and the rule of law. And he's saying actually that you need to start with a strong bureaucracy before democracy. And China started with a strong bureaucracy. Uh, next one, I agree with most points, but slight disagree with low trust is an issue in digital retailing. Okay. Um, do, could you comment on that more or even speak to it? We are happy to hear you comment or type some more. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, I'm eating, so I'm sorry I cannot open the camera. So thank you for the presentation. Yeah, uh, I pro uh, I'm not sure whether like I understand your points correctly. It, 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 it seems like you mentioned like uh, trust is uh, sort of like a culture issue in the China context. No, I, I grew up in China. I just, uh, based on my experience, like, you know, uh, the, the degree of trust between the customers and, uh, and the sellers in the digital platform in China, actually, I would say is very high. Yes, so that, that is, yeah, that's really interesting because that's, yeah. because that's different. Because traditionally, there was, you know, low trust, um, in, 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 low trust in the physical world. Um, and it, to some extent, it shows that the digital retailers have done a really good job, and um, and there hasn't been, although of course there's still a lot of cheating going on in digital delivery, but Alibaba has found has found a way to solve that, right? That um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Regarding like the knockoff goods on the Alibaba, etc., in most cases, the buyer or aware they are kind of knockoff, not the first grade goods. So I, in most in such cases, like uh, they know what they are paying for, and uh, actually, like you know, also it's probably it's difficult to generalize. You know, in, you know, China uh, China has big population, uh, customer in the city. As well as customer in the in the countryside, they probably have different, you know, uh, uh, preferences. But overall, like you know, Pinduoduo is uh, is generally targeting the lower end market. Yeah. For like a JD is is targeting like it's kind of high end market. It's a good, high, with high quality. So overall, uh, no matter what kind of platform, my, but my experience is like uh, it's very high level of trust. You know, for instance, like you know. Uh, a seller on top of like can, can can sell you a new product without receiving the you know the previous one if you have any issue maybe there are some you know other like a chinese customer probably maybe other people can comment on that i just speak from my own experience thank you yes that, that, that's great um uh 
In fact, I'd love to hear from any, anybody else based in China or who's lived in, who is Chinese or you know, has grown up in China who would like to comment. We'd love to hear from you directly. Anybody else? In the meantime, Michael Enright's asked me a very difficult question. I suspect you've got the answer already in your mind. Are there equivalent disadvantages that Western companies might overcome and turn into? Um, and, well, the disadvantage of Western companies is legacy, right? It's the bricks and mortar legacy that they still have. And that's why I gave the example of General Motors, you know, the ultimate bricks and mortar company and Walmart, they are learning to be more nimble. And I think the key thing is to, um, my, my favorite example of this is it, are, are the bricks and mortar retailers that allow the consumer to go online inside the store and order in the store. So you know, get help in the physical store and then order uh, online. So that's turning a disadvantage into an advantage. So I guess the answer is you have to have much more integration in order to overcome that disadvantage. But let me go back to what I was saying. I'd love to invite anybody else or even not Chinese to talk about their experience with retailing in China. I mean, I, I mean, certainly traditional retailers are quick to, I myself have been swindled in Hong Kong when I was younger. They are, they're quick to take advantage of you if you, you know, um, show any weakness. But I think one of the reasons why there's more, of course, one of the reasons why, you know, we know from theories of trust that repeat interactions increase trust and digital, most digital, or many digital interactions are repeat. You, you, know, you don't cheat someone who has the potential to become a repeat customer. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about are small ticket items that people buy again and again. George, can I jump in here again yes, with a quick question? Uh, you identified some important traits, uh, innovation, uh, and the results of that the innovation in the Chinese example, if you step back and ask why are Chinese retailers so much in front of the curve compared to maybe retailers in other parts of the world, what would be the main reasons? I, I, well, I think it's driven by the, one is driven by the consumer because the Chinese consumers are more mobile and digital oriented than the rest of the world, except perhaps for Korea, but you know, um, Korea is a much more developed country and, uh, there's just many more Chinese than Koreans. Also, China is such a huge market and so diverse within itself and growing so fast that physical cannot satisfy the needs of all the Chinese. That's a second reason. So, you know, digital, the long tail of digital and the speed of digital is where it satisfies Chinese. So, and then the third reason I think is because Chinese work such long hours, they have less time to go shopping physically. And again, uh, so yeah, so those, so those are three Chinese characteristics, the diversity of, of the Chinese market and the many, um, and, and, and the many, sorry, so the first one I said was that the, the mobile orientation of Chinese consumers in the first place. Secondly, the diversity and growth rate of the Chinese market and the inadequacy of the physical um, establishment to meet those needs. And then thirdly, the fact that Chinese consumers work such long hours that they don't have time, as much time to go and do physical shopping. George, if I could suggest two additional related oh, reasons mm -hmm. um, that you've actually alluded to before. One is that when the online retailers entered, the physical was so bad within yeah. China that uh, that people were looking for the alternative. Yeah. And actually the online retailers themselves enforced integrity in the sales process much more so than you got in the physical world. And then the other you also have alluded to, and that is late mover, that the 
rise of the Chinese consumer market happens really post-internet. Uh, whereas in the West, you have sort of good enough yeah. legacy, which uh, has meant that people haven't been driven so much to uh, online. Yes, that's a very good point. And in fact, your, your uh, next last point, again, about the trust, links back to the trust point, which is, you know, if a physical retailer in the pre-internet age, if a physical retailer cheats someone, how many people do they tell about? They might tell a few friends or their spouse. If a digital retailer cheats somebody today, who do they tell? They go online and tell everyone. So um, by going more digital, it's actually enforcing more honesty on the part of Chinese retailers and therefore more trust. So I think we've had a uh, tremendous discussion. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, you, do, you want, do you want to wrap this up? Yep. Abby? Yeah, uh, George, thanks a lot. I mean, I you had a lot in the article. It's a really rich article. I recommend everyone take a look at the actual article to get a lot of the details that uh, George had to rush through. Uh, but you've given us a lot to think about. I think uh, uh, absolutely important for people sitting in the US to be aware of some very interesting, innovative developments in, in China. And a lot of people here don't see it and don't experience it firsthand. And so we tend to assume that it's, oh, must not be that important. But I, I do think uh, this is just another example where China is going to be innovating and the rest of the world will be learning from it. I think the potential for reverse innovation is really uh, incredible. That said, thank you, George. Appreciate very much your sharing and summarizing the article for us. And for those of you who are uh, with us, just a reminder that our next event in this series is on November 3rd, same time, 6 to 7 p.m., when uh, Michael Enright will be talking about the impact of foreign companies on China's uh, economy. And while I have you, let me also remind you that the Center for Emerging Markets will have the next India lecture on the 7th of October uh, from 11.15 to 12 noon, when we will be featuring Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is the chief scientist at the WHO. And she'll be talking about what lessons can we learn from COVID-19 to better prepare for the next pandemic. So if you're interested in, in that, please take a look at our website, uh, easy enough to register. We'd love to see you at that event. If not, hope to see you at our next event in this series. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Magda. Thank you to the audience. Thank you again, George. Good night. Thank you.